All right, I'm back. Let's now let's see if we can't get started here. All right, my bit rate kind of like jumped, but whatever. Hopefully, it wasn't too bad. Mm. I'm uh, hydrated, and I've gotten my bottle plus two of a bottle, so I'm so hydrated. It's not even funny. Mm. So yeah. Since I haven't really heard anything from anyone, I'm just going to get started then. So, anyway, let's just... I should actually teach you just basically Clip Studio Paint, actually. Let's actually start with the default one. Wait, no. Let's actually start with, like, a just... Illustration. Uh, boom. Okay, let me. Uh oh. Get back here. Let's start with the, I guess, the default Clip Studio Paint workspace here. Alright. So, yeah, let me just reset, reset Clip Studio Paint to its default so everybody just knows what the hell we're gonna be doing. You know what? I might as well just start from just new files. Everyone will be able to start. So the program I'm using for this tutorial is Clip Studio Paint. And I believe this is the EX version. Yes. So I'm using Clip Studio Paint EX. And it's usually on sale pretty frequently. Let me see here. Let's look it up. Let's see if Clip Studio Paint is actually going here. Let's see. Clip Studio Paint. Is it currently on sale right now? Let's see. How much is it right now? So Clip Studio Paint is not on sale at the moment. But if you wait for them to get on sale, they're frequently on sale. It's it's not even. But I'm currently using the Eclipse Studio Paint EX, so currently it's two ninety nine. Wait for this price drop because, you know, the price drop is way better. Like I think I got mine for eighty bucks. Like it was a massive price drop, and it's one hundred percent worth the money. It's only a one time purchase. You don't need to do any like cloud stuff. And it's it's got so much support it's not even funny. So I'll at least drop the website here, just chill like a madman. And you now Clip Studio Paint, that's my recommended well out uh, everybody else has their own shit, but right now I currently use Clip Studio Paint. There's a billion different programs to animate in. So do your research when it comes to animation programs. I used to use Adobe Flash or Macromedia Flash back in the day. Uh, some people, most pros, use Toon Boom. Uh, other people use TV Paint. Uh, I know there's like a bunch of people who are like, oh, I'm a diehard to freaking Open Tunes. I never use Open Tunes. I probably don't have much reason to use open tunes, but I'll if I ever want to use open tunes, I guess that's there. Uh Blender exists. You know, a lot of people are saying it's grease pendles really good. I've never used Blender because I guess my 3D filter is stopping me, plus I'm super busy with all my other shit. But anyway, Clip Studio Paint, you can animate in the EX version, I think. I think in the pro version, you can do it in a more limited capacity where you're just, you're just like working on, I think you have a frame limit for the pro version, but in the X version, you don't have a frame limit. You just animate as much as you like. But yeah. Now, let's just get through just navigating Clip CO Paint. So, if you press Control N, shortcut Control N, you'll create the new layer, and it's likely you'll probably just start in this illustration tab. So you have a 
illustration tab, a webtoon tab, a comic tab, printing, fanzine tab, all comic settings, and finally the animation tab. You want to go to the animation tab, that's the last tab. So, generally, I generally you'll probably like go to you know, this default where it's like 720 by 540. Um, you know, you could use whatever. Um, you can use like the general high definition of you know, 920 by 1080 at like, I wonder why it's 192 DPI and not like 72 or 150 DPI or even 300 DPI. And maybe it's just a drawing thing, but I'm usually not going to do this. I usually will just go to 72 DPI because it's internet stuff. It's for this. Usually, when you're doing animation, it's mainly for the screen, at least mainly for internet animation. As far as I know, I'm not really going to be doing any like big, big screen theater work stuff, so you know, I don't really expect to do much animation stuff. Now, this can be like 50 by 50. This could actually be 500 by 500. That's the, uh, I believe that's a pixel size here. You can choose the pixel size. You can choose inches or centimeters if you're a Europe person. But since I'm American and I don't know shit about metric, I'm just going to do inches. But better yet, I might as well just do pixels because pixel artists. And also, it's digital art. It kind of sort of doesn't matter that much. Mostly just mostly just there and we've got like blank space margins where this margin stuff kind of just doesn't matter really I could probably just set this to one I actually don't even know if I use this actually maybe like 10 would be good as a little safety thing I'm not even sure very no, let's just make it zero because might as well just use the entire screen. All right, 500 by 500, or better yet, it'd be better if it was like uh, right, like 960 by 960. Like it's large enough that you know it's portable, but not like absurdly tiny. In fact, let's look at some screen sizes. Because that's also one giant thing that most people need to consider when doing animation, is just screen sizing. And working with screen sizes, that will matter in terms of just workload at least. Like if you're going to do a giant big screen and... No, actually no. If you're going to do an animation and you have like this big computer screen... And you set it up so, you know, it's going to be on a giant screen. But then when you actually post the animation anywhere or sell it someplace, it's going to end up on someone's phone where, you know, a tiny detail is not even going to be seen because it's a tiny phone. <laughs> Nobody's going to actually see that. And you end up just wasting your time, work, and money just hunting down stuff on a, a, such an absurdly large file thing. So let me just hunt down my image template. Come on. I'm trying to figure out why the hell. So templates, screen templates. So this is kind of my personal favorite, I'd say, image template setup. I frequently use this for whenever I want to figure out this general HD type of stuff. Now let me turn off my webcam so you can just see this in its entirety. So right here, this is basically you know, a giant screen resolution type thing. At the bottom of this corner here, at the bottom of this corner, you've got the general like screen sizes here. You got 16 by 9. That's like general widescreen format, or 4x3, that's the American 
small screen format. I think these days you're never really going to use 4x3 unless you're doing a retro thing or you're like got to repurpose old old uh, footage and stuff like that. But overall, you're likely going to be using 60x9. I think these other formats is more just um I think European formats. Uh eight by five, you'll probably use that if you're like trying to appeal to the other computer screen people. I mean that's kind of like okay there. Um three by two, three D two format. I think that's also for I think cards five four. I remember like the old television stuff with that and this, but that's kind of how that goes. But yeah, you know, I got this from Wikipedia. Like I could you know, I could probably just link it later, but I mostly just got this from Wikipedia. If you go on Wikipedia and just search up screen screen uh formats, that's mostly how you're gonna find this exact image is if you go on Wikipedia and look up either 16 by 9 or aspect ratios or screen size. That's usually where Wikipedia will lead you there. But yeah, like you've got your various screen size. You've got 2K, which is 1080p, like, like 248 by 1080. I believe 4K would probably be like, well, obviously double this. You got HD and 720 and we got 480 I think 480 is like starting to just hit standard definition and I think if I went any smaller it'd probably be like probably like this stuff so you know what for the sake of just being just slick we're just gonna do the smallest format and that's 480 480 is good. 480 by 480. So that's more than enough for like the internet. We're not gonna make anything gigantic. We're just gonna. We're we just need an animation spot here. So yeah. So basically, our image format is going to be 480 by 480 at a 72 DPI resolution. And we're not going to have any tile safe areas or overflow frames. I'm not going to bother with that. We're not going to do any blank spaces, just zero blank space. Yes, that doesn't matter. Uh, story information, that's mainly for like saving and exporting the animation to something else. So I'd say I'll call this <clears throat> ball bounce animation tutorial bada boom I want to add some more space Hi. the uh, underscore stuff's kind of a weird file habit that I kind of picked up from one of my teachers who actually frequently uses Linux stuff I feel like it kind of just makes things seem a little more official for some dumb reason oh yeah you can't really see my face with this but here I am, I'm back, hello. So yeah, um, other things, timeline stuff. We'll call this timeline probably just ball. And then for the frame rate, so the frame rate's kind of odd. So on default, this frame rate is 30 FPS. And that's a good just general FPS rate for just almost anything. But in terms of like actual FPS, it really depends. Like you need to, find out from your production company or find out from your client. Um, in America, film, early film is done on 24 frames per second. And in uh, like European countries, it's like 25 due to some weird like electronics thing. I forget the actual thing. Uh, Japan, they'll either do like 24, or 12 FPS depending on where they need to you know get a bunch of animation usually it's in a multiple of like I believe three uh, yeah I think like if it's a multiple of three that's usually the best type of rate. so people either stick with six twelve 
or probably 15 or even 24. But if it's a multiple of three, it's ideal for that frame rate because you know if you it's it's mainly for in between stuff. And I'm gonna get to this much later, but you know when you have just uneven when you have an even frame style, it's gonna be really tough to animate with that. It's I'll I'll get to that later. But for now, I think I'm gonna work on just 12 FPS just so I'll save you all the trouble because this is gonna be you know I I want to at least start you easy to kind of just grade you down because your frame rate will your frame rate will also affect your workload too because obviously frame well it's not obvious frames per second fps that's basically the number of well images that go through a i'd say movie sequence a second so in one second 12 pictures will pass in terms of 12 fps in 30 30 fps it'll take 30 frames a second this has nothing to do with video games video game frame rate because that's actually a whole separate deal actually like since you're not doing anything like putting in any inputs this is this uh frame rate issue is going to be negligible to you like i you're you're probably not going to be expected to animate at 60 fps which is what i'm putting shortly like when you're working in 60 fps you can just animate you can just generally just animate like normal and the programmer will just adjust for the actual proper frame rate in terms of video game stuff. But that stuff's like the video game stuff's irrelevant. Basically, the frame rate is gonna affect the number of drawings you'll need to make per second, or at least the number of drawings you'll need to make in order to just register a second of drawing. And let me know if I'm getting a little too inside baseball and into like you know, too complicated. Hey, Joey, Sir Joey. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for stopping by. But yeah, overall, we're going to do just generally twelve frames per second, so it'll be easy, and you'll be able to just come back. Playback time probably be like playback time. Probably put on twelve. Twelve's good because that's like just one second. That's your first second. Or maybe 24. But better yet, let's see, what's 24 times 5? Yeah, that's also another thing that you'll need to figure out with the, the frame rate issue is, you know, each second you're going to have to multiply by 12. So if you were making a 12 second animation, that means it'd be like, what's it, 144 frames? Let's see, 12 times 12 equals, yep, 144. I know my math, <laughs> but yeah. So 12 seconds at 12 FPS, that's potentially 144 drawings that you'll be making for 12 seconds. Can you believe that? Let's see, if you want to make one minute, let's see, 12 seconds, no, 12 FPS times, 60 seconds. That's 720 potential drawings. I'm not saying exactly that much drawings because it's possible that you'll probably do your frames on twos or ones, and I'm going to get to those terms later. But in terms of potential writing, potential workload, this can, your, the time it takes can really affect all your stuff. So, you know, make sure you just do your research and just have your storyboards and your pre-planning ready. Like, when, when professional animators just do their, like, plan out their stuff, they really plan it out because that workload is absurd. Like, people complain about how long it takes for people to create stuff. Where it's like, oh, these episodes are just taking too long. I'm impressed that they're able to like do a weekly format. 
Like, holy shit. <laughs> hmm. And obviously you have a giant, obviously for like television productions or movie productions, you have giant hundred man teams doing or hundred woman teams, whatever. It's, it's an, it's a free country, whatever. But basically it's a giant, most people, most pro animators are in teams. So they're not gonna just, you know. You're not, if you're doing a lot of those drawings, you're going to have other people helping you out to, you know, help with the workload. So, say you had to do, like, that 720, what was it? Let's see. How about, like, a typical 30-minute cartoon at 24 frames per second? So, 24 frames per second times 60 seconds. All right, 60 seconds times... Okay, so 60 seconds times, what's it, 22 minutes for a typical cartoon? So that's like 3,000, like, yeah, that's 30,000 potential drawings. Like, this is fucking insane. But when you have a team, so say, maybe you have a 10-guy team. Like, you just strictly have 10 animators. That's not going into the effects artists or the background designers things like that it's just animators if you divide that workload by even 10 that knocks it down to a thousand like three thousand per guy it's still a lot but that's like i'd say that's like i'd say a doable workload i'd say I'd say, like, if they were doing it full-time, they could probably get out. Like, let's see. If I divided this by, say, eight hours. Like, if they did 396 drawings an hour, they could do it. But again, this is not the absolute total. Like, there's also some other things. Like, sometimes you'll do limited animation. Sometimes, you know, like, you'll have... You'll only need to just do a bunch of holds, or sometimes characters will stay still. This is a sloppy, sloppy estimate. This ain't the exact, this is just math and potential workload. Basically, yeah, it's not bad for one person. It's just, it's not even exactly all of this. It could be lower if, you know, depending on the shot and the type of, work that you're going to need to do but yeah basically we're going to set so so yeah we have our timeline we have our frame rate at 12 fps our playback time at like one frame a second scene number one shot number one division line what does this division line do see i don't do enough research with this because i actually don't know what this division line does but I should probably like look that up. Hopefully that just means okay, this is where the frame ends. Alright. But yeah. Image interpolation, bilinear hard edges. Hard edges is better for pixel art, but we're not gonna use that. We're just gonna use bilinear, because you know, that's good for just general just digital painting and digital drawing, stuff like that. So keep it up bilinear. Uh, do that for also your scaling and your lasso tool, you know, when you're using your scaling stuff like that. Uh, we're not going to use shot template or cell template effect. No, we're not going to use that. We're just going to, this should be fine. So let's, let's name this file ball, ball, bounce. I need an underscore. Ball, bounce. Tutorial, let's say stream, because I do have like a previous practice thing, whatever. Okay, so we're gonna press OK and we are ready to roll out here. So we're starting at the default Clip Studio Paint, uh, the default Clip Studio Paint format here. 
And we're just walking around. These are just the general default tools. You got the basic paintbrush. Double click that, you'll get the color settings. Uh, you can set it to black. It's it's typical. If you're experienced with Clip Studio Paint, you'll at least understand the gist of what Clip Studio Paint's about. And let's just open you up here. And I purchased these brushes from Frendon. These are brushes from the streamer. Well, he's not a streamer. He's another artist. He's called Frendon. I actually totally recommend those brushes, actually. Brendan. And he is, you know, he's got a bunch of cool Manga Studio brushes, so I'm just going to shill these brushes because, you know, they're good for just general, you know, Manga Studio or Photoshop. They're, they're worth the money, I'd say. So I'm going to recommend that and get back to work here. But for the sake of, you know, just generally Clip Studio paint stuff, we're just gonna go all the way down to just the default, like I'd say just the default G pen. So we're not just losing people when they go to Clip Studio Paint here. So here we are, we got general G pen. Nothing fancy, it's it comes in the box. But for the those who are interested in buying friend in brushes, I just posted the link that I use and uh, you know his brushes are modified from myself like what you have is not what I use and what you use will not be what I use so it's one of those things I'm just getting myself warmed up here just so I can get myself used to the G pen and you're not really gonna do anything fancy if you're following along, don't don't expect to do anything fancy because like with animation you need to be punctual is kind of a harsh word. I'd say Yeah, maybe punctual is probably the better word because basically you need to you know just be able to get that done because you gotta get through that thousand drawings you know it's you gotta get through all that stuff and you can't really worry about being fancy which is why you know when people kind of crap on steven universe's art style or you know gravity falls art style that blah -de blah tumblr art style they don't realize that that complicated ass art style means that you know It'll be really, it's, each line will add another, like, several seconds of time that needs to work on stuff. Like, anime, yeah, it looks really good. It looks manga accurate, but it moves at, like, six frames a second. Like, you see a lot of still shots, mouth flaps, stuff like that. I bet you'll, like, have big animation for, like, the big fight scenes. But overall, you know... A lot of stuff is basically a lot of lines that you need to not only draw but draw consistently. That's the giant. That's that's. I think overall the biggest thing that I want you to take away from just animation is learning how to draw consistently. Not just. Not even good. Like you can. You'll get good when you get fast and consistent. Like you'll get good as you do it because. That's kind of how, I guess, learning how to draw works is you get good as you make your thing because your brain gets use, more used to working with the lines and stuff like that. Like you smarter with just what your format is, you, you know how your tools work. Like, your speed will your your speed and your skill will get better as you do it so never worry about like being an amazing artist especially as an animator you're like a dumbass cartoonist whatever <laughs> you're not like doing giant freaking paintings like you're just a cartoon boy which is both great and sucky or at least in my opinion. <laughs>
I, I, I'm feeling, I'm feeling a little uh, jelly about my friends, but whatever. Animation is not illustration, to put it basically. You are, you are planning for motion, and not like just telling a still image story. Hmm. So back to it. So, in Clip Studio Paint, on the top view, and let me just hide the chat or nudge the chat here. Oh, I'll hide the chat because this is probably not as important. I, I can still see you. I can still see you if you talk. Oh yeah, in Clip Studio Paint, you can click on Window, and you can roll down to Workspace, or no, better yet, you can work down from window and you can click timeline and down here is where your animation timeline is and this is basically or at least as far as I know from clip studio paint you know what let me just hide my webcam here because it's not as important right here you're getting my entire pro you're getting the entire program like no no bells and whistles, you're seeing the entire canvas straight from the walls. So, step by step, window, timeline. That's how you do it. Window, timeline. Of course, you can set up the shortcuts keys. Like, if you go on file, shortcut settings, you can edit your shortcuts here. And, you know, it's really good. If, if you're first into a program, I totally recommend you editing your shortcuts that is probably the biggest thing that will make your digital art career much better is editing your shortcuts I edit my shortcuts so almost all my tools are like in the left hand side of my QWERTY keyboard so like Q W E R T is all my shortcuts I even have like a half keyboard here let me uh, show you a half keyboard. Do, 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 do. I got my half keyboard right here. I have a half keyboard that's just right next to my Cintiq. And you know, I've got this half keyboard where I just type in all of my shortcuts. And you know, I got a normal keyboard here. It's an old ass compact keyboard because my wireless keyboard I've been getting royally pissed off at my wireless keyboard for constantly mistyping my strokes so i'm i've now just invested in a wired keyboard i have a wired mechanical keyboard on the way so i'm ha i'm i'm hoping for that but yeah overall basically you know set up your shortcuts and you'll get it's your probably your first step to getting better at digital painting and digital art but yes back to Back to it all. Anyway. Anyway. We also need to get the layers open. So let's go. Windows. Layers. And I'm surprised that the layers weren't like the first thing around here. But yeah. Through this, you'll have your layers. And, you know, if you're familiar with other digital art programs, you've got layers. Layers are just there. Layers exist. No, you make a layer and you can oh, make a layer <laughs> make a layer with a different color there yet uh, animation folder whatever okay you make a layer and you change this to like a red color here make a layer and it shows up on top this is digital art stuff 101 but i'm just you know going through clips to paint just so you'll get it so in terms of this animation file clips to paint has a unique thing where they have animation folders so in the timeline, and I prefer just using the timeline, 
you can create a new timeline, a new edit the timeline, a new timeline, and you can also create a new animation folder or an animation cell. Specify cells, delete cells, enable a new skin. This is the UI. So, Clip Studio Paint has a system where things are in animation folders. So it opens up, it creates a whole new folder, and it appears in the layers here. You can even name it. You can name it Ball Bounce. Ball Bounce. And Mango Ball Bounce. And when you create a new animation in here, when you create a new raster layer, because Clip Studio Paint has both raster and vector layers, that's pretty convenient. And that's mostly like, you know, another feature of Clip Studio Paint is just you can create both rasters and vectors for being able to edit your lines and stuff like that. I personally prefer rasters because I'm used to being shit at art <laughs> no but I, I i just i i feel like the vector stuff kind of like overcorrects a lot of my lines so it, so i don't really use raster layers that much but whenever you create a new raster layer that will create a frame of animation so you can collect you can click create new animation cell or you can right click and it'll automatically just pop up the create new animation cell here. Or you can just click that and bada boom, it's instantly there. Okay, actually no. So when you click new animation cell, it'll just full blown create a whole new animation cell on the frame here. So you move to frame four, new animation cell. Oh. New animation cell. Move to frame six. New animation cell. And this is like whole different drawings. This ain't the actual same frame here. New animation cell. Boom. New animation cell. So now, you know, it's got a general format of two, three, four. I could change this to one actually. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, that's more than enough. But yeah, I could probably just delete this layer. And when you delete this layer, when you delete a layer in an animation folder, you'll kick it out of the cell, even if it's already in an animation. So be careful when deleting layers sometimes. You can just uh, get rid of you and I don't need this. I just need the folder. So, when things are outside this animation folder, you pretty much just do other things with this. And the layers will appear down here as well. Like you'll have like a whole new layer and they'll make a whole new, I'd say, animation folder or layer here. It's kind of weird. But when you're moving forward, when you like scrub through the text here, you'll notice that the background, the white background, not moving. If you click these top left nodes, and let me just zoom this up so everyone can see here. So if you click these top left nodes, or top left or top right nodes, you'll be able to move around the entire, like the entire sequence. That's kind of how you're able to just adjust how long, I guess, a background drawing will appear in a frame. That's kind of how that goes. Let me just shrink you down here. And I kind of just call this my paper layer because basically that's the paper layer. Now we've got another layer that's that could be this could probably be your background. You could write this down, call it background. The reason you do something like this is so sent this at your animation spot. It's it's not you don't expect it to animate. It's basically. 
know, you futzing about. They're just basic freaking. Where's the good brush here? I am, I'm kind of like missing my old screen format, so I'm going nuts. <laughs> All right, uh, one sec while I go find the actual original G Pen here. All right, G Pen, whatever. G Pen, where's layers? Okay. Another thing that you can do is you can drag and drop the tabs. So that you know you can dock them wherever you need to to move your stuff around. So you can even dock whole windows to the other side. And you can move tools here. That's what I usually use. I'm right-handed, so I put most of my tools on this side. Of course, I've Rearrange my workspace. You can save your workspace if you want. You can click register workspace and you can name it tutorial. You can, well, you can name it whatever you want. I'm going to name it tutorial workspace. You can even set it up so you can save your palette info, your shortcut settings, your command palettes, or your unit settings and things like that. So, registering workspace is also a great thing to do when it comes to learning the digital art. And <clears throat> now this stuff, it's probably rudimentary to most people who know Clip Studio Paint, but for those who don't know Clip Studio Paint, I'm going slowly for everyone so they can just get on board with generally Clip Studio Paint. You want to, you know, learn more about the program Clip Studio Paint, there's plenty of YouTube tutorials. You now, Clip Studio Paint's actual YouTube channel goes through just basically going through the UI. But I'm just, you know, doing some prep. So, with the background, you can take a background and keep it not in the animation layer. You can just make a background, hold shift to make a straight line. Or better yet, let's make you like. Hold shift, make a straight line, bada boom, you have the ground. And you could probably do something like a mountain if you like. You know, you see that mountain, you can climb that mountain. And like a little tree, you know, a happy little tree. Like a freaking wishbone tree. I don't know how to draw cartoon trees for some reason, but whatever. Now we got. We got trees, we got mountains, we got background, you know, it's, it's a background, you know, probably like clouds and stuff. I'm kind of just being fancy when I don't have to. All right, so we have a background layer and you could probably like, probably like actually set this so it's not that prominent you know you could adjust your opacity here and or you could adjust your layer settings you know it's it's pretty straightforward but you can lock this background so you don't butts with it you know if you're ever drawing and stuff and you're trying to drag and drop some stuff you won't be able to mess with things it's basic so now we can get to the core stuff the animation file. Oh, if in the layer settings, you will have your animation folder. Turn on your animation folder, and you have a whole bunch of drawings. So, each layer is a whole new drawing or a whole new animation cell. When I when I mention things like drawings and cells as opposed to brains. That's, that's, with frames, it's mostly like the full-on overall film. But when I say cells, that's the actual drawings that I'm talking about. That's, you know, that's the character itself moving around as opposed to the actual animation that's flickering in your eyes. Anyway. So, 
in this uh, giant 12 frame per second thing, and you could probably like pull you to maybe like frame 12 or something. That's currently on two, which is kind of interesting. Oh, it starts on zero. Okay, that kind of like that throws me off sometimes where it's like it starts on zero because I, I remember flash starts on one that's kind of an interesting deal oh yes yeah when you eat when you have a drawing here it'll just go to different deals and you could even like delete a frame where yet just remove a cell it'll just that's it how do you like hide cells? I'm not. Well, you know what? Let's just start with. Let's just go all the way down. So, uh, with this uh blue thingamabobber here, this is mainly your playhead zone. Like, if you play the animation right here, like you can press play, it'll loop all the way up to where the blue area, where these blue lines are and only loop to the, where these blue lines are. It's also where when you're exporting animations, that's the zone of which it'll export. So if you're making a, you know, five frame animation, or well, in this case, six frame, because zero counts, it will only export those six frames. Like if, so, you know, remember that when you're, you know, finishing up work and stuff like that, to make sure you have your blue zone in this entire in your entire sequence so it's now like exporting half an animation you're like ah oh, i got to export again it takes a lot of time but yeah this is your blue zone here so let's actually just get to real drawing so <clears throat> let me get another drink of water here hmm. You know what? For the sake of me needing to just have my webcam out, because you know it's probably just tough. Oh, I would just get it over here, make it nice and large. Maybe like put layer property here. I don't really need this quick access toolbar. You can just close this toolbar or hide it if you like. Hide this. Probably like. Put the sub tool some other place. Put almost everything. I'm gonna do this so you know I'll be able to have the webcam out. You'll be able to just see what I'm doing. And you'll only see my weird face as I complain that I'm making a hard animation. And again, do let me know if I'm going too fast, because you know I'm might just get into the weeds and you know things might be complicated so yeah do let me know if there's just anything that's out of the ordinary or just i'm going too fast for any so let's actually get started <clears throat> so with a ball bounce you need to figure out okay i'm making a ball bounce so basically what goes into a ball bouncing? What does a ball do when it bounces? It's an easy question, of course. Like, what does it actually do? You know what? I'll ask you. This is, this is a dumb rhetorical. It's not rhetorical, but it's a literal question. What does a ball do when it bounces? Yes, it goes up and it goes down. So, basically, up. basically, the drawings that you're going to be making, the ball being up in the sky and being down on the ground. So, basically, on frame one, <laughs> uh, I don't know how to draw, I guess. Chief pen, please, thank you. So, on frame one, we're going to draw the ball on the ground. I can't draw a circle anymore. Shit. Okay. 
So we're going to draw a ball on the ground. Now, that probably just means that you're around. So, the next frame, we're going to draw the ball in the air. Those are our two keyframes. And that's, these are what's called a keyframe here. So frame one, or no, frame one, ball on the ground. Frame two, ball in the air. Frame three will actually be the ball back on the ground again. So, probably be like, so, a great thing about Clip Studio Paint is that you can reuse frames. So, if you right click, you can actually select frames that you want. So, cell no, or not frames, cells. I meant cells. <laughs> um, I'm dumb. So, you can select the cells that you want, and bada boom, you've got a basic ball bounce going. You can do the same thing for numero 2 So, you have what is essentially, when you play, you have what is essentially the first two, you have keyframes. So, the keyframes, to put it simply, is the frames that tell the story. It's, you know, the drawings you make with the frames doing the action. Like, if you were doing a fist, you would be drawing the fist far away and then making another drawing where the fist is in your face making the impact. And all the other, in all the other animation drawings are just the stuff between these two. So, basically, these two frames just tell you what's happening. And, you know, it's very familiar if you, wor if you work with comics. Like, if you work with comics, you'll be doing keyframes all the time because, you know, you're not making it move. You're just making a comic. So, for the sake of one, ease of understanding, I'm actually going to rename this down. Oh, crap. Okay, let's rename you down on the layers. <laughs> hey, couch, how's it going? <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, how's it going? So, yeah, on the layer setting, you'll just rename this down because naming stuff is great. It'll make things much easier for you. And we'll call you up. Now we have two frames down, up, down, up, bada boom. We're happy people. And we can actually just delete this. Delete this. Delete these cells. Because we're only actually going to need the three cells. So frame zero. How about we actually start on up, then down, then up again? Let's see. Um, yeah. I'll nudge you back to. Let's see. One. Yeah. We'll actually start with the one, two, three. So things are slightly easier. And we'll just start with this. So. On frames 0, 1, and 2, we have the first three drawings. So now, we're going to stretch this out to the, <clears throat> the transition frames. So, what these are, you would probably be on, no, you'd be on 2. This would be on four. So we're gonna make transition frames. So that'd be like three, three, four. So we're gonna rename this transition one. Oh, you gotta name it in the layers. Okay, it's not easy to like rename things, but well, for the sake of my ease because I don't know Clip's freaking workflow here. We're gonna call this transition 
in the layers. So transition one, then frame four, transition two. Actually, isn't there a more proper term? I know it's, okay, yeah. It's actually supposed to be called breakdowns. So the actual proper term is breakdown frames. That's the general like term for that most animators are gonna call this the breakdown frames. So breakdown one, breakdown two. So now we're gonna, now with the breakdown frames, we need to figure out how on earth are we gonna just get the top ball down and back up again? The strange thing, because right now it looks a little choppy. Like, actually, no. If you delete this, it looks overall choppy. It looks like, you know, it looks okay. It looks like a weird slideshow. Like, that would be if you were flipping two pieces of paper together, like in Captain Underpants. It's okay, but it's not. You know, it's not animation, it's just a slideshow. This ain't like, you know, it's ain't this, you aren't a Anituber or whatever the hell those kids are called. You are making full blown animation. So here we are. We're making breakdown frames. So, Clipsio Paint has a feature called Onion Skin, where you can see your frames between all of your stuff here. So you're seeing the frame previous to you and you're also seeing the frame up next. And that's very e that's very convenient for basically letting you get your stuff down here. You know, like knowing where you're gonna be drawing and stuff like that. And for some extra stuff you can also adjust how, how many onion skin stuff you do one second yeah playback settings where is it what's it timeline settings that's it oh yes so, so you click up uh, the little settings icon on next to the tab thing and you choose choose uh, show animation cell and choose onion skin settings you can decide the number of frames that you want to actually display as you're going here. I personally like uh, going at least two each so we can just see two drawings. It also mainly depends on you know what kind of animation you're also doing but just know that you can adjust your onion skin settings in between your stuff here. So breakdown frames basically you're drawing what's in the middle you're drawing what's in the middle and you're doing it again pretty easy makes sense so now it looks slightly smoother now if you got rid of that second one that looks slightly smoother but now we have Basically a ball just flat out going up and down, which is actually kind of boring looking. Like, look at this. It's just going up and down. It's not really bouncing. It doesn't look bouncy. So now we need to actually adjust some things, make it look prettier. So here's where your drawing is actually going to be better here. So. Here's where I'm going to explain the term of squash and stretch. Now, squash and stretch will give you that illusion of physics, and I'd say it's an exaggeration. Yeah, squash and stretch also just indicates exaggeration and sometimes anticipation, simplification, you know, techno jargon. But basically, you're going to make the ball slightly flatter because it's hitting the ground. And you know, you can adjust the center space 
and just squish it down since since this is a digital drawing you don't even have to like redraw a squishing ball here like back in the day you probably would actually need to legit draw a squishing a squishing ball here and that's kind of how it goes so let's see how it looks right now looks slightly better actually you know it's it looks like it's bouncier it's still really fast so let's see if we can actually put this on twos now then when i say put this on twos what i mean is that each cell will go for two frames so cell one two as opposed to ones or each cell will just be on one frame each so previously this was just on ones it was each frame is exactly uh cell one frame one cell one frame two cell two or cell two frame two cell three frame three cell four frame four if it's on twos this would be like this cell one or cell five cell uh <clears throat> cell five frame five and six cell three frame three and four I could probably just stretch you out some here. As there's a whole bunch of other stuff here. Okay, so cell so cell one, drawing one, and it goes for two frames, zero and one. Cell two, frame two, it goes for frames. <laughs> uh, I can't do this, I guess. So Cell two, frame one and two, and vice versa, four and five, frame four, frame uh, cell four, frame four and five. This will be six and seven. Then finally, eight and nine. So that's the nature of being on two, so to speak. So, right now, looking slightly better boing 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 it's looking a little smoother and there's a specific reason for that and that's timing timing is basically a feeling of how on time a animation looks this timing's probably a more complicated aspect of animation but it's also probably the most core thing in animation because determining timing will affect animation a lot it can affect an object's weight it can affect the impact that a character makes when they're either fighting or hitting things they can affect how fast a character moves or how gently or smoothly a character moves timing is pretty large like if you're doing something with music timing will affect how pleasing that motion will be to the music and that kind of thing will help so in this case timing emphasizes how bouncy this ball is so say you want to just emphasize that this ball is slightly heavier well you put the first two frames on ones but then the next frame on twos finally the transition frames on ones again basically you have i'd say a slightly heavier ball because you're feeling more of the impact of the ball here and actually let me adjust this for the loop here you're now feeling more of the ball's impact now. You're feeling it actually hit the ground and bounce away. And that's kind of just how the ball will, that's kind of just how timing works with that. <clears throat> now then, let's go all the way back to just basically 
making this slightly smoother. So we have we have our keyframes. I should actually yeah, we have our keyframes. We have our breakdown frames. And now what we need to do right now is figure out how we can also continue to make now we need to figure out you know it it's it looks all right but it still looks choppy now it's still kind of choppy it looks weird so let's make some in between frames now in between as you know as you can see are frames that just happen in between things so we're actually going to make this our in between. So we're going to call you in between probably one. So in between one is basically onion skin, please. Thank you. So in between one is basically, you know, what happens in between two frames. So one, two, three, four. And you know it's kind of like how that goes. Basically, this is in between. This is the motion in between stuff. Boom, boom. We'll call you in between two. In between two. See a Dutch thing. And then we'll just have it so the ball is close to the ground before it hits. Just just before it hits. So bada boom. So far we have an animation just simply hitting the ground. That should set up so it just doesn't loop. I could probably just turn off. Boom. Right there, it just hits the ground. Boom, look at that, Jamie. And now it looks slightly smoother. It's still a bit wobbly because it's sketch art. Mm. And you can always just clean it up in ink and stuff like that because that's kind of how it goes. And my animation's still sloppy as shit. I mean, my drawing's still a bit sloppy, but that's kind of how it goes. Now then. You can also add in betweens right here. So, thanks to the fact that you know animation is like that, you can actually add in betweens right here. In between one, back here, and bada boom, you can just reuse your animation right here. And you can just loop you, and it looks slightly smoother. Now, now that you have basically a giant gist of everything, we could pretty much just start adding some more, you know, adding, putting it on more of a off kilter frame rate. It's a little even. And let me just delete this because this is going to be important. So, so far, if you put this on twos right now. Oh, let me figure this out right now. Let me just put everything on twos so it's nice and even. Do, 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 do. Down. Actually, oh, you can also hold shift to select multiple frames to just put on twos, which is convenient actually. I didn't even know you could do that. That makes sense. Okay, that's really cool that you can just hold shift and 
Gotcha. I was actually badly trying to figure out like how on earth you could just move multiple frames in one deal, and you know I found it out. That's great. Yeah, we're gonna nudge his background forward. And oh yeah, this is locked. I can't mess with the background here. So let's unlock the background so I can actually fiddle with this frame size here. Or cell size, whatever. Relock you. Alright. Then move our blues here. Or better yet, ignore the blues. You're probably wondering why I'm getting why I'm putting my blue away from my duplicate up. And I'm doing this because it'll be a smoother loop overall. Like, when you're doing animation loops, you're going to have to repeat, you're going to be transitioning back to that original first drawing in your loop. So I usually just keep at least a version of the first drawing, mostly as my in-between. So say I was doing one breakdown here. Delete this. Yep. Sweet. And say I was just making a breakdown here and I wanted to like make a new cell. New cell. You'll be able to see, you know, your frames in between so you could transition nice and smooth. So you won't have to worry too much. So yeah, that's kind of how that goes. So, now that we have a rough idea of what the ball should be doing, now we can add some, now we can incorporate things like timing and spacing. Now, I know I've mentioned timing a little bit before, but now we're getting into just more nitty gritty real animation magic stuff. So, I've already explained that with timing, you can drastically change things up here. So, if you put frames on ones, so you probably wouldn't. So, I should actually just explain my current mindset right now. So, you want the ball falling, and what happens now then? Why does the ball fall? Yes, gravity. This, this ball obeys gravity. So, as it's falling in gravity, you'll realize, okay, it actually falls slightly faster because it's falling. And when it's rising, it would have to fight against Earth's gravity to climb back up in the sky. So, what you'll be doing is you'll actually be putting the frame rate or at least putting these cells on ones, so the drawings will go through the frames faster. So, another notable thing when you're putting, doing things on ones, is that you'll have overall faster animation movement. Like, putting, doing frames on ones will give you faster movement. You will, it's great for fast movements or um like super quick impacts things like that like if you're do if you're seeing like a big anime fight scene it's likely going to be on ones because that's kind of how it goes but putting things on ones is great for fast motions now putting things on two it's great for slower motions so we're putting a breakdown on twos and we're having it so it fights gravity So here, it's looking slightly better. Slightly better. And you can probably adjust you slightly. Now then, since it's still not as correct and perfect as you'd like, so what's up with this? Why does it look as good as it could be? Well, now we're going to get to another thing called spacing. Now, you'll notice that this ball actually bounces pretty evenly. 
like it goes down super even which is actually a classic like i wouldn't say mistake it's mostly just a classic way that somebody's likely going to worry animation is oh they're in between stuff you know that's you know if it's going that direction you go in between well you know you go the same way the ball's going down you gotta draw all the ball stuff going in between well what if i told you that you could actually have the same effect with less drawings hmm. Hmm. so so let's actually go back to how the in-between worked or how the breakdown worked so we have it up we have the middle and you have it down so you'll notice this drawing is really even like it's a little boring like it starts here goes there it's still kind of even one way that you can emphasize its like unevenness is if you nudge it if you nudge your drawing slightly closer to the ground because it'll show that it's hitting the ground faster and that's mostly like a drawing thing where you know you're spacing it out so the ball's bouncing faster so right now you're seeing the ball bounce way faster and it's hitting the ground with more impact now let's see how it's actually bouncing right now You're seeing it much harder here. You know, let's just get rid of this in between here. Very get rid of this and break down. Get rid of this breakdown. Of this in between. Actually, no. I want the breakdown. So. <clears throat> I've lost my track of thought here. Okay. The breakdown spacing. Okay. Spacing. Spacing, spacing, spacing. So with spacing, you are setting up the drawing so it's slightly lower. It's going down with gravity much faster because it's obeying the gravity. It looks faster. If you did this, if you wanted to indicate that the ball was way heavier, you'd actually drop a really far down you like make it drop really quickly so probably like bounce like this or better yet let's turn off the loop turn off the onion skin it's bouncing much faster so what if it started out much slower It looks, it looks like it just stops in the air. In fact, let me see something real quick. Yeah. If you just started out where, you know, it's like this, it looks like it just stops in the air. And that's not great. It, it looks like it's fed, it looks like it's just being carried by feathers or held by rope or something. But, if it's slightly closer to the ground, it looks like it's definitely falling. Certainly falling. Now then, you can make this look even better with more squash and stretch. So here is where you can stretch. So we're gonna nudge the, we're just gonna, we're pretty much just gonna squash it ourselves with clip studio paint because we can do that this is digital drawn and we can make it thinner and you'll probably be seeing stuff like this when you follow like the animation smears twitter or tumblr or pinterest where you're seeing characters look like blobs and stuff like that and it's basically a visual representation of the blur effect that you'll see in cameras when they're smearing 
let's open the onion skin again. You'll re notice that it's now thinner than the initial ball that came down here. So look at this right here, and I could probably just thicken this up just a little bit. Now it looks slightly better. And now even the same position. I hope this was the same position. Boom. In the same position, it's like that. So, now when you play it, it looks like it's hitting the ground much harder. And if you put on ones, yeah, let's put this on one so you can just seeing just the frames moving in action here. It's a little stoppier, but that's kind of how it's going to go. Hit the ground, hit the ground really hard. Now then, once you've gotten that, you now add in some other things where you can make alternate in-betweens. I just realized I've, ma I've actually messed up my in-betweens. This is supposed to be in between one and break down to sugar. Whatever, I can, I can adjust this. I'm not completely helpless. Okay, one, two. I've messed up here, but I'll figure this out some other how. Make you up again. <laughs> Pardon me, I'm kind of like trying to figure out some stuff here. I just realized my webcam's actually in the way of the rest of the frame. I don't know, do you care about the webcam? You probably don't, so. I'll just close the webcam right here. You can just prepare it. Let me see if I can't shrink it. Can I shrink the size of the webcam? Yeah, let me just see if I can't just nudge it down a little smaller. Bingo. Now it's slightly smaller, and you can just see exactly what's going on with this. So, <clears throat> bada boom boom. Back to what was it doing? So, for the sake of not losing drawings, we're just gonna go back to the breakdown. Breakdown to okay. So, for the sake of wait, in between and breakdown, that was a correct term. Ah, you know, I I I need to practice this more. I'm not. I need to remember my terms a little better. I need to practice my stuff more. But you now we're just gonna go, we're just gonna keep at this. As I wanna at least just have you bouncing a ball right then and there. So, anyway, we've gotten a breakdown. We've gotten basically the ball falling fast. And now we're going to make it down a little longer so frame one frame two frame three and four next drawing is frame five and then the loop is frame six so currently it's looping like this Which is okay, you know, it's it's going. It's it's things are happening real quick. It's really fast, but it's gonna go. So one other thing that you can do, you can do the same thing with the other side where you can adjust the breakdown so it goes high. And it gets it hits the uh, top of the gravity really quickly, so it can finally just fly. I want to actually clean this. This, a, this little slight hair thing kind of bothered me. Okay, so 
you can do the same thing that you did with this other breakdown. And now, it looks even better because it's hitting the apex jump. It's hitting the apex of it's hitting the apex of its height, like it's hitting the maximum height of the ball. And it's slowly slowing down due to gravity. And it's getting ready to fall back down. So this spot's pretty nice. I tend to refer to this as hang time. <laughs> this, is, this is dumb and pretentious of me, but I like to refer to these two frames as the hang time frame because that's basically how it goes. It's slowing down as it hits the top of its jump. And while it's in the air, you know, it slows slightly down because gravity slowing it down from finally getting up and hitting the top of the sky here. So this is kind of how it goes here. And another interesting thing with this is if you put this loop, if you like actually left the last frame and the first frame together, That'll look like it's also on twos, technically. Because, you know, you got one frame here, but you have the same... You have one cell here, but then you have the same cell right here. So technically, it's like two cells at the same time. Like two cells, like the down frame, but it's two drawings going out for two frames. <laughs> uh, this jargon is dumb, but you know, right now it's looking good. So now we're hitting in between. We're hitting the in between zone. Now then, let's get to the actual first in between. So, thanks to the fact that we don't need to do much with the breakdown, we'll be able to use less drawings because the illusion of animation looks much better. Now it looks it looks like it's, you know, it looks it looks like your eye is registering that the ball is falling because the drawings look like it's falling due to timing and spacing of the animation. So, with the in-betweens, it's kind of an interesting technique that I found from basically Richard Williams's Animator Survival's Guide. And you can pretty much just get this, or Animator Survival's Kit. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I'm having a bit of a Mandela Effect moment here because... Let me just get the large screen here. So, for the longest time, I called it Richard Williams' the Animator Survival's Guide, which really the Animator Survival Kit. <laughs> I've Mandela Effect myself when it's really the Animator Survival Kit. But, you know, this animation is pretty great. It goes through a lot of things like uh, the ball bounces and things like that. I'm usually just going off of this knowledge, so if you can find the book on Amazon or you find like a illegitimate copy, you know, you know, feel free to just find this book and teach yourself because, you know, it'll get you through the core basics. It's not going to get you through like anything fancy. This book's a bit drier than most other animation books or animation I'd say workshops, but I'd say in terms of just learning the core basics, the animator survival kit is where you go for that. So anyway, why am I putting the ball on the ground right here? Well, I'm putting it there to sell the fact, come on, I'm putting it there to sell the fact that it's hit the ground. So let me, uh, sorry, let me show you what I mean. 
Looks like a really expensive book. Um, yep, how much is it right now? Let's go on Amazon. Amazon.com. Let's see, Amazon.com. Richard Williams. And why are you doing this? Williams. Amber Survival Kit. Bingo. All right, so currently the Amber Survival Kit is $23.57. So, you know, it's it's like 30 bucks roughly. It's it's the price of gas, or at least gas for like a sedan or half a tank. And of course, you can easily get it used if you want. Like we can go there, get the paperback pretty used. Let's see. Use acceptable now, use is all right. It's it's like a textbook size, so you know, grab it, use. It's pretty good. Let's see, how much is eBay selling that book for? As eBay's also a good place that I check for animator survival kit. Let's see, how much is eBay selling this for? Twenty one forty six. Wow, this is even lower. Oh shit. Someone's selling this for eight ninety. Oh, I love eBay because it's just way cheaper. Like, is this a bid? Yup, it's a bid. Fuck. Ah, it's a bid. <laughs> ah, ah, well. It's likely you'll like. There's five days left in the bid, so you know what? Let me just drop. Let me. If you want it, I'll drop a link to it. Oh shit. Is there a way that I could like get a short link? I don't want this murder anyone. Just this link. Let's see. I like the Twitter link has something shorter here. Come on, Twitter. Come on. What a boom. There we are. Yeah, hopefully Streamlabs doesn't like give me some flack about it being spam or anything. eBay is kind of weird with that. But yeah, I'm going to drop the freaking bid link cuz you know why not. If you can if you're good at bidding on eBay, you'll probably get it for way cheaper than what you could get at Amazon. But you got to remember that you're bidding, which means other people are looking at it. There's currently one bid on this animation book right now. Oh. Let's see. 5 days, 11 hours, 43 minutes until you know shit finishes so you know if you want this book yourself it's all yours yeah let's see what are the other suggestions for the anime survival kit i'm told that there are other animation books like uh let's see cartoon animation by uh preston blair that's also a good one I, i'm told i think i've gotten like the original cartooning one Let's see. There's also where's the Eric Goldberg one? Let's see. Eric Goldberg. Yes, bingo. Yes. The animation the character animation crash course. And that's a pretty good that's also another one that I think people recommend for this. So the animation the character animation crash course you could probably like you know get that get a use all that stuff and of course you can go on YouTube like YouTube youtube.com wait a minute yes youtube.com animation tutorial bada boom I'm sure like the first person is like what's it onion skin Alan Becker, who else? Tip Tuck. Oh, Rubber Ninja. I totally recommend Rubber Ninja. He uh he works with Adobe Animate. Uh let's see. This guy Tip Tut. Zedrin. I think he uses this. Uh Zedrin uses clip for this one, so that's pretty good. Jesse J. Jones, that's for Kritka. You know, it mostly just depends on what program you're using at the moment. But yeah. YouTube, you know, you can look up YouTube tutorials besides me. 
I don't even know if I'll be able to keep up with all this stuff, but that's kind of how that goes. Back to adventure. Let me take a drink of water here. <clears throat> yeah, hydration. All right. Well, let's actually just start looking at what this is looking like so far. So let's look at this. So, because of this in between, it looks like it's impacting the ground way harder. So, if you put that on twos again, boom. Now, it looks like it's just hitting the ground way harder. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, the ball bounce is looking much stronger because the in-between. It's looking smooth, but somehow with less drawings, it's magic. Excuse me, I'm burpy. Sorry about that. So, because the magic's just hitting the ground, I could probably do something like, say, they like, thin this up, just yay. <clears throat> As contrast the thinness with the thickness right here. Thickness. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. Mm. I am really coffee. Oh, yes. Boom, boom, boom. And because of that contrast, the impact looks a lot sweeter because it's hitting the ground way harder. So. Let's make it so it comes back up. So now we have the down pose. Now let's figure out how we're gonna make it go up. So, one thing that we could do, that we could actually slightly nudge you thinner so we can see a bit of speed going here. And next, we're going to get another in between here. So in between two, between two, onion skin, onion skin. Now we're going to thin you up and make you slightly higher in comparison to frame two here. Or, you know, it's the first in between. Because, one, it'll look different than the initial impact. And two, it'll sell the bounciness of it. It'll sell it popping off more than, you know, it the initial ground stuff. Here. We're going to have you here. Boom, boom. All right, well, let's try you. try all right so far it's looking pretty good pretty cute pretty neat huh and you could probably have this have the uh, up pose even longer it's pretty neat now we can do some other things where put the rest of them on twos push you forward and now it's looking slightly slower because it's fighting gravity more boom yeah, that looks pretty decent and of course this isn't exactly Full blown, a legit Super Bowl. This is mostly like you seeing it in motion, just being half decent with this. So, you could do some other fancy things, like you could make another in between here where you know, you're seeing up, seeing it up. Uh, you're also like making like 
another in between here where oh yeah like wonder where the hell's the onion skin where it's slightly slowing down you're selling it slowing down to the gravity this is kind of not drawing a perfect circle let's see here not boiling but it kind of works it looks slightly better you now it looks slightly more impactful it's hitting the ground better all right that's a little too slow that first breakdown was much better actually Yeah, that looks much better. Just the wobblies bothering me. Yeah, let's yeah, press the tab button to just get rid of the UI and you can just see the entire thing. It's pretty great. But yeah, so far, you know, it's looking pretty good. Obviously, you could probably do something where... And I've used roughly 10 frames. Yep, 10 frames in this animation one two three four five six seven eight and eight cells so i managed to make an eight cell animation loop with like 10 frames so at 12 fps frames per second i've made a super simple ball bounce and you know it's nice and basic here now you could probably just add a few other fancy things and I'm going to do that mostly so I can demonstrate the animation folder system. So, one thing that we can do right now is that we can add effects like an animation shadow here. A new animation folder, call you shadow. Now we can pretty much just add a new cell call you probably like R and basically we'll probably just make like a teeny b little shadow here oh oh I know what's up like wondering why the hell this ain't the shadow thing Whatever. So we got far. Then we have close. Make a new animation cell, call you close. Now we could probably just do the whole erasing thing. We don't even have to if we color it. We could just, you know, if we color this animation, we could easily just fix this. That'll be no problem. Whatever. Close. Close. Far. Then back to like far again. Now we can pretty much just do something where we have like a basic. We could probably even just nudge close to here, actually. Nudge close to here. Yeah. Another interesting thing about shadows is that you can pretty much just do where the hell you want. You know what? <clears throat> yeah, let's reset the shadow thing. in the ground slightly before the in-between hits the ground. That's pretty interesting. Back up. Then we're gonna make another in-between. You may like 
break down two, down two. Then we'll probably like, oh, where's the cell? Yeah, that makes it sell like, wait a minute. Break down two, probably like, put this here. And a lot of this is now just the more tedious aspects of animation where I could probably like put break down one, or better yet, break down two here. They just nudge break down two here. And thanks to the fact that you just got a cool layering system, you can just layer them down here. Yeah, Shadow's not as smooth as I was hoping. So let me just... <coughs> Let's actually just not be lazy and actually just do the legit... Let's do it legit. While you break down one. May like erase you. Oh. What the hell? Let me turn off the skin because things are kind of like weird. <clears throat> yeah, things are kind of like wrapping up more or less because there's not much I can really explain any besides. You know, have fun. <laughs> this is kind of a cop-out answer, but it's kind of the truth. Out of boom. Then you could probably just do something like, say you want two layers to appear at the same. Wait, it can't work like that. Shoot. How do you do colors? Okay, I guess you do... A separate color folder too. Call this new animation folder. Call you colors. Alright, new cell. Call. You could probably just make like a white layer, or better yet, let's uh, make you blue. No. Yeah, we'll make you bright blue. I like blue. And we'll probably just make the like a big smooth India ink. That'll be nice and yeah. So we're I'm pretty much just doing some super fast fancy pants shit right here. Cell, call you down, and let's see if I can't repeat you here. Nope, new cell, your whole new animation cell here. Can I repeat you? No. New cell anyway. Yeah, you're always just hunting for ways that you can just save time or work, you know? Because when you're, like, on a heavy deadline or anything like that, you know, you are you constantly want to figure out ways to figure out time savers and things like that. So, you know, if, say, you're, you're looking for, like, a specific reference of something and you want to make a period piece about certain trains instead of like just learning how to draw a whole different train if you find a model of the train or a photo of a train 
there's there's little wrong with like tracing the train like tracing is kind of a dubious thing because on the one hand tracing obviously saves time in a lot of professionals but on the other hand if you're tracing someone else's artwork without credit that's a big no-no but if it's like things like mechanics and machines or specific period pieces i think it's a little more fair game because you know it's more mechanics and it's probably a little more owned by a company like a faceless corporation and obviously they don't have feelings because fuck faceless corporations <laughs> uh but it's kind of like one of those deals where you know if it's a person tracing's probably a no-no with that so i recommend like tracing for specific machines and i think if you make sure that you're not obvious about the tracing like if you have a high detailed if you have a high detailed boat in a dumb cartoony setting it would look really out of place so you gotta pick and choose what you're saving work on and also if you there's also tracing your own works completely fair game like, if you've drawn something, you don't have to draw it twice if you can get away with it. Like, do whatever you need to do to get your deadline done. It's a little insane, but I'd say, you know, I'd, <laughs> when you're trying to be a professional, or at least when I'm trying to be a professional, or at least when I'm trying to save time with some things, that's kind of how I've been trying to adopt that sort of mindset. I'm going to add one more animation folder here. That's mostly just lighting. We'll just call you lighting. And what I'm more or less just going to do is I'm just going to add like maybe, let's see, a like shiny. Shiny blue. This is illustration one, so I'm not really going to go into full blown. Oh, how do you do lighting? You study lighting. <laughs> you know, you you study lighting. You figure out what the heck lighting is. That's kind of how that goes. So, of course, there's obviously a shortcut setting for this, but I'm not going to just completely abandon you all just for shortcut setting stuff i am doing this completely through clicks i'm just right clicking clicking new animation cell let's bring back one a little wobbly but it's all right and that's pretty much an interesting deal where, you know, you're making a nice rough animation. You know, I could probably add a few more frames just to smooth it up a bit. Like I could add like a few more in-betweens where, you know, you could probably like stretch this even further, like make another frame where it's just shit stretching. Even more. But if you stretch it too much, It'll end up looking like mush. The one thing that you also need to remember is that more frames will not automatically equal better animation. Like, if you've seen one of those, uh, those, uh, computer edited GIFs or those, like, like, what's it, machine learning animations where, you know, it, what's it, interpolates the frame rate to 60 fps and it looks like a soap opera and it kind of looks like it looks stiffer like yeah it looks smoother but also looks much stiffer and less snappy it doesn't look like you know there's been i guess a human element to it it doesn't have that like explosive ability that some animations will have it just looks a bit smooth 
I mean, I'm not knocking the tool. Like, obviously, tools are tools, and you use whatever it takes to get the right effect. But, obviously, you know, use tools wisely. You know, don't just hammer walls when you got a screwdriver, you know. Like, if you've got a screw, use your screwdriver. And if you don't have a screw, like, don't just use a screwdriver. So, yeah. I might as well just also just explain how you go about actually exporting animation. Yep. Just go back to ball bounce to here. That was my freelance project that I was working on. I technically don't even need to worry about this. I've never signed like an NDA or anything like that. I've kind of just... I think, like, out of professionalism, I don't want to show off freelance projects that I ever worked on. I think I'm going to change that later, where I just set up my freelance projects so they're not completely... So I'm able to stream anything I'm working on. I'll probably, like, set up my contracts so that... So, exporting animations. I should probably do that. So, here's how you... Export an animation. So, you can export as either an image sequence, an animated GIF, an animated sticker, or a movie. I recommend you don't use animated sticker because, you know, that's for like, what's it, Telegram and stuff like that. This, for something like this, this, this ain't going to be a sticker. For an image sequence, Image sequence is the best possible thing to use because image sequence will export your entire thing into picture files, which will be easier to send to people as compared to video files or GIFs and things like that. Like when you're sending an image sequence, you are sending just a series of a lot of pictures. It's easy to just transition, like transfer pictures all over the place. Like you can put them on a zip drive way easier than a movie. And if you did an animated GIF, it'll compress the hell out of everything and it'll possibly lose quality for the internet. And obviously if you're exporting it as a movie, it'll be a really high file size, but you know, it's still really high res, but it'll be a really high file size, and there's a possibility that the picture quality will actually be slightly down because it's an MP4. I believe you can only export things. Oh, wait, you can just export things as an AVI or an MP4 with Clip Studio Paint. So, ball bounce, I'll call this stream. Right, apply to the camera. Now, a lot of this out really futz with. So, you know, just do that. You can export video smaller than 2G. Most programs and devices support this video format. It's safer than export ABI 2.0. It may not be possible to make the background color transparent depending on video settings. This format you can export up to. 7,680 pixels wide by 4,320 4, pixels high. I'm assuming that's 4K. I need to do that math. Let's see. You know what? Let's do the math right now. So, what's 2K right here? Where's 2K? Okay. So, currently, this is 2K. Let's pop open the, ca Let's pop open the calculator. All right, so 2048 times 2, that's 4096. So no, that's not nearly 4K, so you're good. <laughs> so it could go to like probably like 8K or something, but you're not going to be doing that. That's insanity for freaking Clip Studio Paint. I can go uncompress, Microsoft Video Compress. You know, it's, it's your choice. Obviously, you want to start as uncompressed as possible in case you want to take it to formats like uh, Premiere Pro or After Effects or any other video editing or even just YouTube. 
you want to at least be as high as possible so you can mitigate the quality crushing the picture. Like, if you're going to be making a cartoon with lots of colors, you want to at least have all those colors close to how you had it initially. I'm going to save this as both an animated movie and an animated GIF, just so everyone can see here. All bounce, stream one. I like one. All right, and generally I can just keep it to export range, and the export range is from zero to nine. So obviously, you know this blue spot keeps the exports correct, and this is obviously great for pixel art work. You know how I'll, I'll probably like talk about how you can do pixel art in Clip Studio Paint, but these days I usually just use a sprite for doing all that stuff. Anyway, at frame rate twelve FPS. But it's possible that you could go to 24. You can change it up if you like. But I myself like to just stick with the original part that you had in the first place. I usually prefer like unlimited loose because it's a GIF. Like who would just have it loose a few number of times? It's weird. But that's like your preference. You've got that option. All right, so we have the video file. It's an MP4. Well, actually, no, it's at an AVI. Then we have a GIF. Yeah, you'll notice that the frame rate's a little half, but whatever. Yeah, you're probably not even seeing it on stream. I can't really sync them together, but whatever. It it it's it looks all right. Boom, exports, and I have pretty much just explained ball bouncing, I'd say, from start to finish. And this took me, like, probably three hours, but the more you do it, it'll take you, like, maybe five minutes. Probably not five minutes. I'm over-exaggerating. But you know, ball bounces are simple. And the principles that happened with the ball bounce are going to transition to working on real things like characters and, you know, characters running fight sequences. And if you're constantly wondering what to do next, like in between me working on stuff and stuff like that, I also recommend 51 animation exercises to master from the website animator island so if you want to you know commit to making more animations and just learning by yourself this is probably just the best possible way to do it you'll be able to just practice and these are and this website will just explain to you just prompts of how you're doing the animations and stuff like that like ball bouncing in place is number one like i just explained ball bouncing in place number two is ball bouncing across the screen and i'll probably do that be another time i'm doing a tutorial where i'll explain how you make a ball bounce across the screen and then you know you'll have a brick falling off a shelf that demonstrates weight and speed and things like that and then you'll actually just start going to character stuff so you know it just chart goes further and further to more complicated things and you know if you do maybe like one a day you will well probably not one a day yeah one a day. I'd say if you did one a day for 51 days, it would take you like, like if you did it, if you did one a day for 51 days, that's like almost like two months. Like that's my college course. So yeah, if you did animation in three months, you'll get good enough, or at least you'll get to my level, <laughs> basically. Like. That's, if you do all these practice stuff in 
three months. You'll get to my level easily. Easily. Like, you'll probably not get to, like, a full-blown anime studio person, but, you know, it's, it's doable. So I'd say I still highly recommend, if you really want to work on animation and stuff like that, uh, this is probably the best possible way to start. And obviously, making cartoons is different than making animation because... One, you're telling a story, you're making characters, you're getting voices for dialogue and stuff like that. Those voices need to know how to act because voice acting is still acting. They still need to know how to act. And obviously there's other acting techniques and things like that. But overall, you know, this is, this is a good start to learning how to animate. But yeah, you know, let me know if you have any questions, if I haven't answered anything, or if I missed out on something, or if I kind of like explained something and made something real confusing. You know, let me know. And, you know, I could see if I can ask me. And, you know, feel free to DM me anytime. You know, just feel free to drop me a message or even just drop me a thing you're working on. You know, I might not get to that message like instantly, but obviously I see it. It's social media. Twitter will let me know or Facebook or Instagram or Discord or wherever I am. I'm I'm there. I will probably answer your message and you know, I do like looking at work and you know, helping out when I can. It makes learning all this stuff worth it, actually.